Hi, Hartford. Uh, I am Tiffany Longworth. I use she, her pronouns. I am an SRE. It's approved. And I wasn't always in ops. Uh, actually, when I started at Puppet like six years ago, my job was as the consultant coordinator. So I made sure they got to the right client with the right materials. Uh, and I quickly automated myself into boredom. And so my manager was all like, hey, you want to implement some software? And I didn't realize I was supposed to say no, so I said yes. And uh, I learned some really hard lessons. They left me with some deep emotional scars uh, and a drive to figure out how to do this stuff right. And that's why I'm giving this talk. So you can end up with completely different emotional scars when you try to get people to adopt change in your organization. So, uh, but because we're in tech, change is constant. You roll out one thing, hopefully you get to iterate a few times, but all too soon the business is gonna pivot onto something else and you have to rip it all out and start over again. Now when this is done well, it's amazing. Like, the thing you have been doing has been brought into the world and people go, man, your baby is so amazing. Uh, but when it doesn't go well, it is the worst. Because the people who are rolling out the change have no idea why all these people are not adopting your clearly beneficial tool or process. The people resisting the change wonder why it's getting shoved down their throat. They don't see the benefit and why they should change from what they've been doing the whole time, that, which means that they don't actually end up picking up the change you're doing, which means that you've got a bunch of subverted processes and you've got a lot of shadow IT and the thing you were trying to fix doesn't get fixed, which means in six to 18 months, we're just gonna try it again and everyone's miserable. Nobody has the energy to do it. Has anyone had a terrible experience like that? Okay, so just as we're a bunch of nerds that like computers, there are nerds that like change and study this. And they have several frameworks, and one of them is called ADCAR, which is an acronym for these things. And I'm going to hang my talk on this framework. So first of all, in order to have a successful change, people need to be aware that a problem even exists. They need to desire the fix, know how to fix it, be able to implement that fix, and then be reminded constantly because we are all human. So uh, to be clear, this is not a talk on how to force your crappy change onto an unwilling populace. Uh, we have not yet reached the dystopian future where you can get force pushed directly into someone's skull. This is talk is about how to communicate your change in a way that it will be adopted. And the first thing to, about that is making sure you're doing a good change in the first place. My personal favorite part of any change management that I do, whether it's a tool, whether it's a process, is the stakeholder interviews. So when we think about making a change, we are usually thinking about our experience about it. And our experience is necessarily limited. Uh, and if we're just making a change that only impacts us, then, you know, cool, whatever, just do the change. But we're usually having problems uh, getting change to stick with other people. So everything we do has edges that intersect with what other people are doing. I make a change here, it impacts you down the road. You need to have a clear understanding of what uh, your stakeholders are experiencing. So stakeholder interviews are the most important part of a change management, in my opinion, because you're gonna figure out how aware they are if there even is a problem in their view and what they do desire, because maybe you have different desires. So uh, when you go in, what you're not doing is saying, hey, I'm gonna implement a new pipeline and you're gonna adopt it, what do you need me to do? Because they're gonna be like, oh, well, you already got it, like whatever. I could be eating lunch. Um, come in and just ask questions. Here's the space. How do you experience it? Uh, what are the things that keep you up at night? What do you wish was better? And even if they identify the things that you've already identified, let them have that. That whole IKEA problem that Paul was talking about, let them own, like, oh yeah, I identified that. Like, Sorry, I got a microphone. Um, I write down everything they say, whether they wish that your new tool will 
mow their lawn for them, or whether they're actually asking for something that is reasonable and that you could deliver. Write it all down as if it were completely viable, and then ask them to sort. What is the most important thing? They're gonna have a lot of wishes and desires and fears. Figure out what is most important to them. Ask them what they've got in place that absolutely cannot be destroyed or undermined. So if they have a dashboard that's absolutely crucial, maybe your change is going to be a terrible change for them if you break that. Figure out what that is up front before you go all the way down the change pipeline and then find out nobody wants to love your baby. Um, ask them to sort it by importance. And whatever you do, do not preach like, oh yeah, we're totally gonna do that. Because you don't know what everybody needs and you might end up with conflicting requirements. Uh, so don't make promises. This is not requirements gathering, this is exploration. Uh, and do, do not make promises. All right, so. After you've talked to all your stakeholders or a representative subset of all of them, uh, you start building out your tool now that you know what is needed and what is desired and what will be able to be adopted by your group. After you've done this, you're not gonna hit 100% of everybody's wishes, dreams, and desires, so come back to them and have a conversation before you launch. Uh, if you can't make enough people happy, maybe you shouldn't even go down this path. Maybe you should just stop and let it be fallible. When you go in to follow up with your stakeholders before your launch, give them as much credit as humanly possible. Even if you were already going to do that, again, IKEA, like, you said that you needed this tool to do this, or this process to take into account this, and we were able to deliver that. That gives them ownership and allows them to become more of an evangelist, which is what you want when you're rolling out a change, as opposed to enemies. Um, speaking of a really good way to make an enemy, is to have them expect to get one benefit and then not deliver it. The hard part about this meeting is telling people what they can't get and letting them be able to be okay with that. And the way you do that is you're just up front. Explain, you wanted this, but this other team had different requirements. And when we looked at the whole business thing, turns out that theirs was the greater business need. Are, is this still gonna be okay with you? Get them to understand where you're coming from because when you do launch and the rest of their teammates are like, mm -hmm. They can be like, well, yeah, but like sales needed blah, blah, blah. Um, use this. I'm not telling any stories. I should tell stories. Okay, cool. That first project where my manager uh, told me or asked me to roll out some software, what was our problem space? It was at the time when sales sold something to a customer, all their conversations were logged in Salesforce. Uh, when they sold the product into the customer, the consultants went on site and, you know, maybe made some custom modules, wrote down a whole bunch of notes about what their infrastructure looked like. I was working at Puppet. And, uh, and then they put all their notes in a separate tool, a really dilapidated wiki, and then support, once they got a hold of the customers afterwards, would take care of their needs in a support tool and none of these tools talk to each other, which could lead to a lot of pain. And so I had stakeholder interviews with sales and consulting and support, and I just wrote down everything they wanted. Um, and then I had to come back and be like, hey, support, I know you wanted this, but sales' need was actually far more impactful. Will you still be okay with us rolling out this particular solution? And they're like, fine, the better way to do that is to be like, we can't rule it out with what you want right now. Here are some ways that I think, given us, given three more months, we can roll out something that will meet you halfway. Is that good? And that's what they liked. Um, so you seek consensus in that way. And the most important part on this one, one of my deepest emotional scars, is look out for new stakeholders. So. The tool we ended up going to create a single view pane for uh, the customer view was kind of like if Facebook and Wikipedia had a baby that wore a tie. Um, it, was, it was pretty fun. And 
Salesforce would stay where it was, Zendesk would stay where it was, we would ingest this information and put it into a panel, so if somebody wanted to see all of it, it they would come in there. Um, and this was a great win, in my mind, because our wiki at the time was super crusty. It was like, it took multiple seconds for pages to load, you couldn't find anything, it, it, like nobody ever said anything nice about this wiki. So replacing that with a new tool, I was like, oh, piece of cake. I neglected to pay attention to who was a stakeholder for the wiki. That also included like product and HR and marketing, all sorts of other people use this wiki and they had, they all experienced the same pain of the pages loading, but they all had different requirements that I didn't take the time to go in and interview them for. So when it came time to launch, it actually got shut down at the executive level just because there was not enough coverage of those other things. Uh, and so of course I was like disraught and I like gnashed my teeth and wailed and read a whole bunch of books on change management so that this would never happen to me again. Um, so please don't let that happen to you. Always evaluate if your stakeholders have evolved. Okay, but you've seen this talk. You've done all your interviews. You've followed up with all your stakeholders on what will and will not be included. You've gotten consensus. You are ready to roll this thing out. Start with the tigers. What are the absolutely terrifying, catastrophic things that are going to happen if we do not do this change? You really, really want to go for an emotional impact here. We're a lot of tech nerds and we can kind of be like, oh no, feelings are manipulative, oh that's terrible. But here's the thing, emotions are the way you compile code for human consumption. If you simply start with the details of you should get out of your sleeping bag and put on some shoes and unzip the entry to your tent and exit. Uh, the optimal exit is probably in a north-northwesterly direction. They're already halfway inside the jaw of the tiger. Nobody's paying attention if you start with the details. Start with, oh god, there's tigers! Like, wake people up. Okay, um, some really good examples of tigers are recent pain for the, that one that I was talking about, I could say, hey support, you remember that time where you spent two full days working on a customer's issue before you realized that the consultant that went on site built a custom module and they're not working with what you thought they were working in the first place? Man, didn't that suck? Do, do you want to do that all the time? And they go, no, like that is a great emotional appeal. This can be their pain, it can also be other people's pain. Like, hey, did you see that security issue that happened? I sure hope that doesn't happen to us, don't you? Make those kind of appeals. Uh, future threats are great, especially if it's like the government hammer, like, oh, GDPR, you just gotta do it. It's a clear and present tiger. Changes in compliance, if competition is coming for your lunch, maybe, maybe you should change so that you can react to that. And my personal favorite is a misalignment with self-identity. Uh, so, if you have a company, say you work at an automation company, and you have th three different tools for tracking things that relate to one customer, and you have to manually click in to three different places to log in, man, shouldn't we automate that if we're really who we say we are, if we're going to be an automation company? Like, who, who wants to be known as a hypocrite? Who, wait, let's try the, the other one. Who doesn't want to be known as a hypocrite? Yay, okay. Um, drawing attention to those types of issues is really, really powerful. Um, which leads to our second step. Once you have pointed out the tigers laying in wait, People also need to know about the puppies. What are the good things that are gonna happen when we do follow this new tool, when we do adopt this process that you're asking for? Uh, again, you're going for an emotional impact. And as much as I wish that people cared about data quality, they don't. What they care about is being able to go home like at peace because they didn't have to stay late reworking a project because uh, the first time they delivered it, the data was bad and so they had to rework everything and munch the data and now everyone's angry and da 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 da. 
what they care about is like, if your data is clean, you can go home on time regularly. That's a really good puppy. Um, similarly, uh, that self, I'm just gonna jump straight to the self-identity one. Be like, hey, you will be who you say to be, who you want to be if we adopt this change. People really like that. Um, again, you can point to, will your work be easier, less, or more interesting once we adopt this? And continued employment is not uh, do this or else you're fired. It is more, if we do this, then the company will not succumb to like being sued or uh, our competition won't completely devour us and leave us. And then also the greater good. Is this actually going to improve the tech community? Is it gonna improve your actual local community? Is it a green initiative? Are we saving paper? Like, let people feel good about themselves. Make them start seeing all of the great things that'll happen when they do this tool or process. Now, it is only, only after pointing out the tigers and the puppies that we move on to the knowledge aspect. Never, ever start here. If you start here, people will zone out, they'll get bored, they'll freak out, they'll be like, oh God, what am I gonna do? I'm never gonna remember all this stuff, I've got too many things going on. They don't see the big picture. Um, who here has seen someone try and say, uh, step up and say, we have created a new dropdown in JIRA so you can track the origin of the bug you discovered, uh, whether a customer found it or whether you found it in QA or whether you found it during da 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 And then at the end of six months, we'll have enough data so that we can see like where all of our stuff is coming from. And then like six months later, nobody's used this. Nobody even remembers why it's there. H has anyone seen that? Was it because people didn't know how to use a dropdown? No, they just didn't care. Like, you need to give people a reason to care in order to get them across that cognitive hurdle of changing the way they do their work. Oh. <laughs> um, before, like one of the very, very first things my manager at Puppet ever asked me to do was like, hey, we need to move half of the team from this half of the building to join the other team on this side of the building. Uh, can you make that happen? And I had just gotten out of the Marine Corps. I was like, yeah, I can make that. Mm, you got it. Uh, and so I made this beautiful plan. I was like, okay, so here's the optimal layout when we finally get there. And in order to do that, we're gonna have to go through this narrow hall. So this person goes first, then this person, da 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 da, -da. Here's the order of operations. Here's our expected timeline, da 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 da, -da. And I sent all these beautiful details out to the team, and they went, but why? And I was like, what do, we, what do you mean, but why? Like, the, the boss told us to move, we, we, we move. And they're like, yeah, but, but like, I've got a window seat here. I'm like, yeah, but there's a window over there too. They're like, no, 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 but there's like a tree and there's a bird that lives here. Like, there's not, that bird's not gonna be over there and we've got like a relationship now. And I, I was just like Pfft. I've got friends who are like, yeah, you, you looked like you had just gone through five hours of advanced physics class. You were just, yeah. Um, so, never ever start here. Uh, also, we industry-wide have a habit of, uh, who's heard of read the frickin' manual? Has anyone been told read the flippin' manual? It's an awful thing. Um, and it's awful not only because you're saying, like, go help yourself, I don't, won't help you. Um, it's also bad because not everyone learns best by reading, so people who have different learning styles have to work harder in order to get to the same point. So, when you're doing your knowledge, you should understand that people learn differently than us, or like everyone learns differently and uniquely. Here are some samples of learning styles. Uh, if you are more of a visual person than a verbal person, maybe this helps better. Uh, you can, exact same information, but I've presented it in a graph, so you can be like, oh, solitary and group are actually like subsets of these other types. And I'm not saying that you have to make a podcast and make a video and make a group thing and make a solitary thing. You can combine lots of learning styles with a few things. My favorite way to do uh, launches on this knowledge aspect is, I've 
I write the docs and the how-tos while I'm creating my tool or I'm figuring out what the process is gonna be. So that's already documented if someone just wants to RTFM. But the best thing is when I launch, we're like, here's the why and here is a class. And so there is a group context where I am standing in front of a classroom and going over the materials that I wrote and we're also doing some hands-on stuff. So people who are tactical learners get that immediate feedback that they miss when they're just reading a, a doc. Uh, people who are visual have that. The secret sauce is in recording this class and making that available along with the doc so that people who are uh, auditory learners but learn best in solitude can just watch it later and hear me talking through the thing. Is this making sense? So write your docs, record a live class, and share the recording. Is like, you hit so many different learning styles this way. Okay. All right, next, ability. If everyone knows that the way to change uh, an asteroid coming to Earth is to knock it off course, uh, but we don't have rockets that'll knock an asteroid off course, we're screwed, right? So, uh, ability, is really important. You wanna give people someone that they can emulate to prove that it can be done. You wanna say, I wanna be like Mike. Mike has already adopted my new tool, my new process. And you wanna walk through the details, the specifics of what it is that makes them successful. Because the more details you have in that aspect, the more someone can visualize themselves in those footsteps. And the more they can visualize it, the stickier your concept will be. That being said, the stickiest concepts are the most straightforward. So try and make your launch as uh, just super simple as humanly possible. Oh, I need water. All right, so because a lot of us really pride ourselves on being detail-oriented and geeky, being able to hold like lots and lots of random facts in our head, but we all get lazy and tired, and we really only nerd out about our stuff. Who here is all like, oh man, finance, tell me all about your regulation stuff. Like, I just wanna throw that in there with my uh, Linux kernel details. Like, does anyone, we can't nerd out about everything all the time. So, you wanna make your change as smooth and easy for people to adopt as possible. In change management parlance, this is often called clearing the path. So, I, uh, my favorite uh, way of clearing the path is subverting imposter syndrome. So we all have tools that have like toggles and fiddly bits and like secret handshakes in order to make the thing work. Those are bad. Those are friction. Those make people feel bad about themselves when they can't do something that seems pretty simple. So one of the tools we launched was an HR information system, and we chose the tool because it was so simple for end users to just walk in with something in their head and then be like, oops, I accidentally did what I wanted to do and I didn't have to consult a single document. It was just easy. Uh, this worked perfectly except for in one situation, for time management tracking. So if hourly employee submits their hours, that was, it looked like it was from 1996, but it, it worked, it was fine but the managers had to go through like this labyrinth of button clicks and it was different every time before they could approve and then it would look like it approved but it didn't approve and it was terrible. Everyone felt bad about themselves. So what we did for that one is in our wiki in Confluence, we had the troubleshooting page and we're like, hey, if you're here, it's probably not you. Here's a gif of a baby monkey. Watch it as long as you need to because you've probably just been through hell. And then after that, then we went through all the toggles and handshakes and fiddly bits. Um, letting people know that it's not them goes a long way. Also, when it comes to ability, if your manager says you can't do a thing, then you don't have the ability to do it even if you have the ability to do it. So make sure management's on board. Learn that one the hard way. Okay. Hooray, you launched it. Everyone's aware of the tigers, the puppies. They know how to do it. They're able to do it. We're done now, right? Who's seen something just get launched with a lot of fanfare and then just not happen? We are all human. We all have a lot of stuff going on in our worlds. Um, we need reminders. So, how can we remind people? 
Uh, we're here at DevOps Days. We like the DevOps, which means that we like clams or calms or cams, uh, which means that we like measurements and metrics, which are great because they show us that we are successful. But not only do they show us we're successful, they show other people, hey, that thing that we did like last week, it's already going up and to the right. You remember that thing we did last week? And they go, oh crap, I'm supposed to be on the up and the right train. And so like, it'll remind people, yes, I need to do this. Also, if you're able to track who has implemented your tool, like just go through and like, is the pipeline there? Is the pipeline there? Oop, no pipeline on this repo. I can go talk to that team. Because if people are not doing the change, they are likely busy or terrified. The fix for both of those is help. So go in, say, are you having issues? What do you need? And work with them. Um, Iteration announcements. Uh, you, I've launched some things with some pretty big gaping holes in the immediate thing and said, we're going to fix this soon. And then followed up very quickly and said, look, we heard you complain about this and we fixed it and now it's better. Keep giving us information. And that actually propelled the change more, I think, because they saw that people were invested and were going to iterate. This, of course, only works if you iterate, um, so you should do that. Go ahead and put it on your calendar now, like we're gonna have a retrospective with those initial stakeholders and ask them, okay, cool, we did this, what's the next most important thing? Get them to help, ask them to help you groom their, your backlog. Uh, if you can end of life support for the old way of doing things, go ahead and do that. We don't always have that power, uh, but there is nothing better for getting people on board than to say you can't do it any other way and then onboarding. New people are a font of enthusiasm. Tap into that. If they can come in to your company, like they're already being like, oh man, am I gonna, did I, did I really deserve this job? Oh man, there's so much to learn. I'm gonna be seen as a failure and they're just gonna fire me immediately, oh God. Um, but if they can come in and your docs and onboarding materials are so good that they feel competent, they're going to talk to people around them and be like, oh man, wasn't that cool? I think that's awesome. Uh, which will remind all the older people like, oh yeah, yeah, I guess I was supposed to do that, wasn't I? Okay, cool, fine. Hack new people. All right. So if you are into summary slides, you should get out your camera because here they come. So what did we go over today? We went over the ad car model. The ad car model is awareness of the tigers if we don't do this change. Desire to fix the thing. If nobody cares about the problem, then they're not gonna change to fix it. Only after you've pointed out puppies and tigers do we go to the details, the knowledge aspect. You want to make sure that you have varied instructions for people of all sorts of different learning styles. Ability, make sure they're actually able to implement your change and Reinforcement, because we are all humans. Uh, if you think this is as cool as I do, here are a few books that you can read more about these. I've told myself for a million years that I'm gonna come up with something that takes exactly 10 seconds to say during the slide so people can take a picture if they want to, and this is as good as I've gotten, so. Thank you, Hartford. Uh,